Okay, can everyone hear me? Yeah, yeah great. So, um, I'll find first. I'm going to start with an image. Uh, I really like this photo. I think it captures some kind of cultural phenomenon at the minute. We'll look back in a few years at people just stopping to look at their phones um, before they kind of go into the subway where there's no data and think it looks really funny and weird. Um, and it's been captured recently, have you seen the EE ad? So it's sort of Saatchi and Saatchi did with uh, Bufferface and Kevin Bacon walking around. Um, I think they're really tapping into something uh, interesting there. So I know I do the same thing when I'm, when I'm in London. If before I go down into the tube, I always want to get my map sorted so that I know where I'm going and things like that. Uh, the problem is uh, the web was never really designed to be what we're using it for today. Um, and it's done a really impressive job of becoming an application platform, but it's kind of taken a strange route to get there. I mean, the web was designed for this. Uh, but now we run Unreal Engine on it, or you know, streaming video services, or who knows what else. And it's great. I mean, the web has achieved what Java never really quite managed, which is becoming the universal app platform. The thing is, because of the route we took to get here, there are some really basic things that we haven't quite figured out yet, like what happens if you don't have an internet connection. And at the same time, the way we've used computers has obviously changed. So once upon a time, computers filled entire rooms, and you had to apply to run your program on them, and someone else would go and run it for you. And then they got smaller and cheaper, and we got personal computers, and all of a sudden, you didn't need to ask permission. You could just run something, and it was yours, and it was easy. And a huge kind of explosion of creativity ensued with uh, you know, fun games, Manic Miner, stuff like that. Uh, and now many of you have computers in your pockets, or perhaps on your wrists. Um, and it's not mad to think that perhaps soon we'll have them kind of implanted in our bodies, or in the fridge, or who knows where else. But there's one thing. We've kind of gone back. And once again, we're relying on this big central computer to do our processing for us. Uh, and if you can't connect to it, then, well, you're stuffed. Uh, so I think maybe we've lost something uh, from the PC era. And we could probably learn something in terms of how we build our apps as making them more autonomous, a bit more independent, so that people aren't so tethered to this central service that we control. Uh, maybe you think this isn't really a big issue, because the internet's getting better, connectivity's improving, um, mobile broadband's getting faster. And yeah, the device you use today in the way you use it today is probably going to have great connectivity in the future. Uh, it might even be good enough that you don't need to think about offline. But that says nothing about the markets of tomorrow or the devices of tomorrow, which might be very small, might need to be low power, and so can't connect all the time. I think it's a short-sighted view. We are nowhere near solving the problem of lots of devices, lots of mixed environments on a global scale anywhere in the near future. And by the time we get to doing that, we'll have you want Wi-Fi on Mars or something. <laughs> so at the minute, we build our applications in a very fragile way. If you've seen the heretical film, A Phantom Menace, uh, <laughs> You'll know that the battle droids in that film, very good little robot things, they can kill, fantastic. Um, there was just one problem. If you blew up the control ship, they all just kind of turned off. Uh, and that's how our apps are today. Um, and the likes of Jar Jar Binks can just kind of push them over. And Jar Jar Binks is better at offline than us, so we should probably do better. Uh, so this is the proposal for doing better at offline. It takes its inspiration from a movement a few years ago called Mobile First. And what this proposed was that we should start by building the mobile experience for our applications and then build on top of that and layer on top until we get the full fat desktop version. This had a few pleasant side effects. The first of all being that because you had to 
start with a small screen, you had to really focus on the UI elements that were important. Uh, and that meant when you scaled it up, you actually had quite a clean UI on the desktop. The second is that it really made sure that your mobile experience was good at a time particularly when mobile was huge and booming and it still is today. So what does mobile first look like in the offline environment? Well, it's really simple. Uh, you just build the app for yourself. That's it. It's just you, a text editor, a browser, and that's kind of everything. You don't need a server or a database. In fact, that's kind of the whole point. Um, so it's fun. You just get to build things. So uh, as Remy said, I work on a project called Hoodie. And Hoodie, if you're not familiar with it, is a way of building full stack applications using just front end APIs. But we were very keen from the beginning that these front end APIs should work whether you're connected to the internet or not, or whether you're connected to the server or not. And so you could just start drop in the hoodie.js file and start building things on your own, and you don't necessarily even need to run the server. Uh, and so we blogged about this idea. We called it Offline First, and it was picked up, and uh, lots of people were interested in it on Twitter, quite a buzz around it. And we thought, OK, maybe there's something to this. It's not just us. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to build an Offline First app. And let me just switch over. It's called Lolbin. <laughs> so as, as Remy mentioned, um, he gave me a challenge to build a JS bin in kind of live coding in sort of half an hour or so. Uh, that's very humble of him. I mean, JS bin is actually quite slick, <laughs> it turns out. Um, and you're probably going to see enough JavaScript today. So I invented my own version. It's called Lolbin. And we're going to store jokes in it. Um, so get thinking about jokes. Um, and we have a couple of buttons down the bottom here. They don't really work or do anything yet. Uh, we just have some CSS, and I include the ace editor here. And there's a little bit of code that adds things to a list, because I didn't want to write the template live. But that's about it. OK, so switching back. So we've got our basic design and layout already done, because that's kind of you all know how to do that. Um, now, the fun part is we want to turn it into an app that I can use on my laptop as something kind of real world useful. So we need to persist some data. And we have a few options. Uh, one of the obvious ones is local storage. It's got a really simple API. You have set item, get item, remove item. It's about as complicated as it gets. It just has a few issues, though. First of all, you can't store very much data in it. Uh, and the other is it's synchronous, and so it blocks the UI thread. So if you do kind of max out your local storage data, you can have visible pauses while it loads it all. Uh, not so good. So let's say we want to store a lot of jokes. <clears throat> you can all read that, right? <laughs> um, I'm not expecting you to. IndexedDB is uh, really, really cool. So it's asynchronous for a start, so it doesn't block the UI thread. It has transactions. It has uh, indexes. It's got all the stuff you need to kind of build proper data-driven apps. There's just one slight problem. Uh, the uh, API is a little complicated. But thankfully, there are some really great wrappers. And so we already talked about Hoodie, and Hoodie provides its own API to the storage mechanism. Um, but I'm actually going to have a look at PouchDB today. So PouchDB, if you've not seen it before, in, can use various uh, backends for its storage, one of them being IndexedDB. And it has a really nice just get, put, style API for storing data. And crucially, as you can see in the screenshot here, it has really good sync support as well, which we'll look at in a little bit later on. So OK, demo time. Let's have a go at adding some PouchDB to the app you've just seen. <laughs> so here's my app. I have CSS, images, JavaScript, pretty standard. Uh, my index HTML, I'm not using a build tool. I have like 10 script tags. Uh, can you see that? It's a bit dark. Sorry, you'll just have to squint. Um, and here we have some demo. So this file is where we're going to add in all our persistence code. And I've got a few comments in there just to remind me what I'm doing. You don't need to worry about those. The main thing is that this top line here where I create a new database using PouchDB. Let me just zoom in a bit. Maybe that'll help. 
Um, and then I initialize the sidebar, which is just that code that adds items. So the first thing we want to do is hook up this little add new button. So I'd like it when I press it to prompt me to, for a joke and then add it to the database. So we get the add button. We have a click handler just there. Um, and then we prompt for the name. And then what we're going to do is create a little uh, JSON object like this, which is what we're going to store in the database. It has an ID, which is the name, and some text, uh, which is going to say lol plus name. Uh, uh, great. And then we use the DB to put it, put doc. That takes a callback, which can optionally have an error. We're not going to handle errors. This is live coding. We're going to live dangerously. Um, you, you should definitely handle errors. I'm not going to. I'm a, I'm a professional. <laughs> so uh, OK, so we've stored the document. And the next thing I need to do is just tell that sidebar code to select the new document. Select name. Great. OK, let's switch back and refresh. Add new. Great. We have a prompt. Anyone know a good joke? OK, I'll, I'll start us off. Java. <laughs> Uh, OK, that's cool. So we've added it. It's stored. If I refresh the page, it's still there. It's persisted. I could turn my laptop off. I could come back tomorrow. It'd still be there. Um, ah, we don't have our little lol Java text. How do we get that? So next step. Great. So when the sidebar changes, that means when I select something or click on an item in the sidebar, then all we want to do is to db get. Uh, the name of the doc, which is the current value for the sidebar. Error, the document. And then all we do is get the editor, and we set its value to the text. Hopefully, lol Java, fantastic. That's pretty cool. Uh, the only problem is, if I type things in here and refresh the page, it doesn't save, because we haven't hooked that up. So next thing we're going to do is when we change something in the editor, we want to make sure it persists back to the database using PouchDB. So what we do is when the editor session doc on change, we want to get the current documents. That's the one that was selected again. That's sidebar value. And we want to compare it with the text that's in the editor. So if editor get value does not equal document text, then we know it's changed. And so then all we have to do is tell the DB to update the document. Uh, and we set the text to what's in the editor. Refresh. Shall it be controversial? OK. <laughs> Coffee script. OK, that's next. Uh, OK, so moment of truth. Let's refresh. Fantastic. It's persisted. So we now have live saving to the hard drive as I type. That's pretty cool. The only thing is, it's actually saving on every character press at the minute, which is probably a little excessive. So what I want it to do is wait until I've stopped typing, and then after a couple of seconds, then persist it to disk. So let's have a look at that. Uh -huh. OK, so we're going to use dbounce. Uh, save later. This is just a uh, low dash. I'm going to do deep call db update, and I have to bind it. Um, that just means that this is bound to db when I call update later. Uh, and we're going to say, when I stop typing for two seconds, then save. That's all that does. And so now we replace this with save later. And because there's going to be this two-second gap where it's not saved, I want a visual representation of that fact. I want to know that I have unsaved changes. And so the sidebar has another little function that lets me mark um, entries as being dirty. So use the document ID and dark local sequence. What is local sequence, I hear you ask? 
Uh, I'll get to that once I finish typing. So um, local sequence is in PouchDB, it just stores a log of every entry as you save documents. Um, and so they're numbered sequentially. It goes one, two, three, four, five. And this is how it knows how to um, synchronize with another database. Uh, it can kind of go through all the changes in order and compare them with the remote server, and that's how the sync works. Um, so it's just kind of built into PouchDB. We're going to use it for the sidebar just to say that this is the log entry that I know has, is marked as um, saved or dirty. And so it knows if there are unsaved changes. That's all it does. Uh, OK, let's write that. Refresh. And now hopefully when I type, just over here, you'll see a little pencil. Great. Two seconds. Aha. No. We have to use another feature of uh, PouchDB, which is uh, the changes feed. It's really cool. So do that, get out of the top. So um, you can listen to a change event on the, well, that's not change, uh, on the database. And anytime anything gets saved into your local store, um, it will emit this with a little object here. And all we do is we tell the sidebar that that has now been saved. And change document ID and change sequence tells it which log version was saved. So let's try that again. So you see it did save. Pencil. <laughs> no. Oh, well. It's saving. Aha. Got there in the end. This time it's going to work. Hey! <laughs> okay, that's good. We've got the typer out of the way now, so the rest of the demo is going to be plain sailing. Great, so that's it, that's it. We've, we've used PouchDB, we're persisting things, we're responding to changes. Um, we have like a nice thing that tells us whether we have saved changes or not. Um, and that's it, great. This is already a pretty usable application. Um, so that was PouchDB. There are lots of other wrappers around IndexedDB that you could use. Um, JS Git can store things in IndexedDB. Uh, if you've not seen this, this is a cool project by Tim Caswell um, and other contributors. And it's um, the Git protocol implemented in JavaScript. So if you were going to do, say, a document review application or a small wiki, that could be a really good choice. Equally, you could just have a really simple um, get, put, delete style API like local storage um, just using index TV behind the scenes. And this is local forage. Uh, so you've got lots of options. Uh, so now we've got our offline app, and it works. And I could use that quite happily. I could um, turn off my computer, come back, use it offline. It, that's fine for my personal use. But let's say I want to synchronize between devices, and I want a backup in the cloud. Sorry, I said cloud. I didn't mean to. Um, so if we're talking sync, the first thing I want to think about is um, databases. And the obvious choice is CouchDB. CacheDB has this really great um, master master replication. And it's just an um, adjacent document store, so it's very easy to just drop things into. Uh, and crucially for us, it's the replication protocol that PouchDB also talks. So it's going to be really easy to hook these up. So let's do that. Whoa. Here we are. So you see at the bottom, I've got a little sync button that doesn't currently work. What I would like to happen is when I click that, it sends all my local um, documents up to the server. Add some more new lines. So all we do is when I click the sync button, whoa, we want to get the database and replicate to my local couch DB. Five, nine, eight, five. Um, and we'll call the database lols. 
kind of it. It's pretty amazing. Um, so let's just listen to the complete handler here. And what we're going to do is tell the sidebar that the remote sequence, so that, that log ID, um, has been updated. And we're going to say, uh, what's this? We get some info back. <coughs> last, last sequence. OK, typos, no. Let's go. Let's add another one. Any good jokes? I'm just going to slowly alienate the whole audience by going through your favorite. <laughs> what else should we do? Oh, controversial. <laughs> That's right. So um, great, we've persisted a bunch of things. Now, ah, we've missed a crucial step. I have to start CouchDB. Uh, Docker to the rescue here, folks. OK. Let's go, let's go look at CacheDB. That's fun. Ooh. OK, so this is the CacheDB admin panel. Um, as you can see, it's just a clean install. Nothing, nothing there to really look at. These, these are just kind of uh, installed by default. Uh, great, so now we've got CacheDB running. We've hooked up the sync button. Just refresh, make sure we've got the latest code, and click sync. Wow, do you see the little icons change? So that is, you might not be able to see, that is a little cloud icon next to a disk. So I'm saying it's on my disk and it's in the cloud. OK, let's go look at couch. Let's refresh. And there it is. There's a lols database. It has three documents. Let's go look at our lols. Grunt Java Windows, brilliant. Yeah. So there you go, sync in like three lines of code. It's pretty impressive. Um, oh, yeah, and also, if I add new things, oh, could I think of another one? <laughs> what is brown and sticky? <laughs> That's a great, I don't know if I want to send this to the server. Um, <laughs> But the thing to remember here is we've got a nice visual indication of um, these ones have little clouds. This one doesn't. So I know that one's just on my laptop. It's not synced up. So if we click sync, it gets a little cloud icon. We can check. Let's have a look here. What's brown and sticky? A stick, lol. Great. So what have we learned? Um, well, syncing with pouch and couch should be is really easy. Uh, also, the spinner is a lie. This is what I see when I try to use most of my apps offline. Uh, I know it's not talking to anything. It's just there to taunt me. <laughs> I hate it. Um, so with all of about five seconds thought, I came up with that little pencil icon for unsaved changes, um, a hard drive to say it's stored on my local machine, and a hard drive with a little cloud to say it's synced to the server. And already, that is a 1,000 times better than this stupid spinner. Um, if there were designers here, I'm sure you can come up with something much better than the crappy little icons I used. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's awful. Thankfully, uh, there are people experimenting with new ideas in terms of the save icon and spinners, things like that. And there's a great thread on Branch if you're interested. Uh, I just picked out one of the examples here of different ways of representing the state of your document because when we can't just have saved and not saved anymore. If you're doing offline, there's kind of saved, there's persisted to the cloud, there's shared, there's you know, synchronized, all kinds of different things. Um, and this is a really fun example. Uh, a friend of mine showed me this on their little internal web app. And what happens is it makes this face when there are unsaved changes. The eyes spin around when it's synchronizing. And when it's finally sent all the data, it has a little sleepy face. <laughs> I love it. I think it's amazing. Um, so you could be playful with it. It's, it's kind of a wide open field. Don't feel you have to stick to the save icon. Um, great. So I've got my little offline app. It works for me. I can synchronize with my server so I can get backups. Uh, the next thing I want to do is share it with other people. And I don't know if you can see, but up here, I'm just using the file API. We never actually even started a web server. So how do I share this with other people? Well, uh, we know how to do that. You use a web server. 
uh, all we're going to do is add an extra little step, which is a manifest file. And that's going to tell the browser what to download and store locally. And then when I disconnect from the web server, it can just serve it out of the cache. So let's have a look at that. We can close you. And we'll close all of you. Um, what's it called? Login app cache. So I'm just going to copy this file in because I didn't want to write it all out. Um, but this is what um, uh, an application cache manifest file looks like. There's a great big list of things that I want the browser to cache. Again, I'm not actually using a build tool, so I've got lots of JavaScript. Um, there are some things that I need the network to access, and that's CouchDB. Uh, and potentially, I could even add fallbacks for when you're offline. So normally, you try and get this network resource, but if you're disconnected, use this local one instead. And at the bottom, I have this little comment, which currently just says foo. Um, normally, I stick the uh, current date and time in there, because there's a strange thing with app cache where you have to actually update the cache document, in, even if you change one of these files to let the browser know it has to go reload them. Uh, great, so that's that. The next thing we need to do is hook it up into our index HTML. So all we do is manifest uh, lolbin.appcache. What else do we need? Ah, we need a web server. Let's just kill couch. OK, so we have a web server. Let's do this. Great. So that's cleared um, the list at the side here. That's because it works on uh, origin. And because I've changed origin up at the top here, that means I get a fresh database to work with. So let's just add something here. Oh, what's a good one? Uh, great, so, oh, right, we can't sync because I killed Couch. Don't worry about it. It's saved locally. We're offline. Um, so now what I can do is I can kill that, and I can reload the page, and it's still there. So server's dead. Page still works. Fantastic. Um, so this is how we can, you can disseminate your applications, the little offline app that you built just for yourself, and share it with other people. Um, there are some issues with app cache. Uh, there are so many gotchas. I had a bunch of slides on them, and it just took me forever to go through all the ways I hate it. Um, <laughs> so if you're going to implement AppCache, go and read about all the gotchas, because you can get in some weird states, and they're quite hard to get out of if you get it wrong and you've delivered something to a client already. Um, but the main problem I have with it is actually in terms of user interface. So what you're expected to do is go up to the URL bar at the top and type in the URL of a server, you're disconnected at this point, uh, a remote server that you know you can't talk to, type it in, hit enter, and you get your app. No one's going to do that. That's horrible. That's, I mean, we've spent so long telling people that this is where you type remote things. Um, it's just completely weird. So thankfully, browsers are getting a bit wise to this, and they're starting to shift people in the application Direct, um, direction. And this is Google Chrome. Uh, you might have noticed they have these little app icons you can use now. Uh, so you might want to package up your app so you get an icon. It's much more natural to click an icon than to enter a URL or click a bookmark. Uh, and similarly, if you're using web technologies to make mobile apps, obviously you want a way to hook into their desktop environment there. Um, if you're creating something for the desktop, you could potentially use Node WebKit and just hook into the OS so that you can launch it with an icon. Uh, similarly, if you're going to use uh, iOS, Android, there's PhoneGap. And really, all you want is the launching bit. It's just a hack to get around the fact that um, the web doesn't really kind of work as an application platform yet. Great. So um, I can deliver my application to all of you. You can all save data locally. But let's say we want to actually interact and share data. How do we do that? OK, let's go back to Hoodie. So. Originally, this little demo was going to be written uh, in Hoodie, as Romy mentioned. But there was just one problem. I started preparing the demo, and I just added the app cache plugin, and there was nothing left to do. It wasn't a demo. So um, I wanted to show you some of the underlying tech, which is why we ended up using PouchDB and a couple of other things. Um, but if you want to play around with this and don't want to mess around and just have everything work, then 
uh, try Hoodie out. It uses the same principles under the hood. Um, and equally, with Hoodie, we have some more advanced ideas as well. And one of the things that, we're, because we're uh, totally writing applications using front-end APIs, we have some really interesting problems with permissions and sharing, things like that. Uh, and this is the way that we've done sharing data between different users who have an off offline database. So we give each user their own CouchDB database. So you saw in CouchDB I had the lols database, which had my jokes in there. Someone else would have their own database with their jokes in. Um, and the great thing about that is it makes that replication part really simple, because you're just replicating completely with a database. You don't have to figure out which changes you're allowed to see and which you aren't. Uh, the problem with that is uh, when we want to share data. So all we do on the server is we set up replication between different users' databases. So if user A wants to share something with user B, we just mark that document as shared, and we have a filtered replication that just says, whenever there's a change to this document, copy it over to user B's database. When user B comes along later and connects up, it just pulls down all the changes, including the thing that um, user A shared with them, and it's available for them to use offline. So. If, if you're not used to CouchDB, where it's quite normal to have lots and lots of different databases, that might seem a bit weird, but it, it works really well. Uh, and it avoids you getting bogged down in the data models. You can have quite nuanced sync, um, uh, kind of uh, quite a nuanced control over what is synchronized to the client and what isn't without having to get too bogged down in the data. Uh, so equally, you might not want to sync some things, and so you could have a database, perhaps the data set is too, too large to pull down onto your device, and so you can just talk to one remote one and not sync with it. So that seems to work really well. Um, okay, so you've built your offline first app. What does that mean? What impact is it going to have? What's going to do for you? First of all, mobile is huge, and offline first ensures great mobile experiences. I kind of think a good offline experience is kind of like good security. Uh, people won't really notice it when it works, but that one time that you mess it up and they get to the airport and they can't load their boarding pass, um, they're never going to trust you again. It gives users more control. So um, Helvetti Mail, did anyone use Helvetti Mail? OK, two people. Um, so this was a custom style sheet for Gmail that gave it a nice little minimal interface a few years ago. Um, I used to like it. It's kind of cool. Uh, this can work because we control most of the presentation part in the client side. We have CSS, and we can tweak it to our liking and make things look the way we like. Um, with offline first, we're pushing more data and more processing down to the client. And so you potentially have more freedom to change the way you query the data and present it than you did before. So I'm kind of interested to see what um, the, the data version of a user style sheet looks like. It's about trust. We already talked about the missing boarding pass situation um, and the fact that the spinner just lies to you. But this is a really important part of building things offline first, is that you have to really consider the differences in states in your, in your uh, application. Uh, and this is really common. This is a screenshot from Gmail on Android. And from looking at this, I don't really know what's available offline and what isn't. I mean, I'm at the top of the list, so probably all of them. But I don't know for sure. And there have been many nervous kind of fumbling around with my phone at the entrance to an event looking for tickets where I'm just never sure if it's actually going to be there or not. If I star it, does that work? I don't know. Um, so there's a lot of room for improvement here, I think. Uh, you don't need to deliver all the data all the time, just the right data at the right moment. This is kind of the way that um, mobile first forced you to focus on the important UI elements. Offline first for forces you to focus on the important data, because you have to ship it all down to the client. And so it really kind of, it, you might be more efficient in the way that you can um, shift things, and you need to understand the data that's really applicable to the interactions you want to build. And related to this, it's the uh, final frontier in performance. So we spend so long pushing out our, uh, our assets to content delivery networks and trying to get our service to scale across multiple machines in the cloud, when the nearest device to me right now is in my pocket, uh, and in this room alone, there is loads of untapped processing power just waiting for a developer to use it. So we should be pushing more down to the client, getting really low latency UI. 
And this is perhaps my favorite uh, feature of offline first development. It protects from service interruptions. So we have built applications based on Hoodie and then had cloud outages and not a single complaint because the app still works. I mean, we designed it to work pretty much flawlessly offline. People don't even notice sometimes. Um, so you know, fewer 2 AM calls to fix the server is a good thing. Uh, scalability, perhaps you don't even need a backend. Uh, this guy didn't. If you start with building your application just for you, you're much, less, you're much more likely to end up in a situation where you don't rely on a central service. And so it's much easier to scale up. Um, selling an app that doesn't connect to a central server is a really easy way to scale. Uh, OK, so that's offline first. It's an ongoing discussion. We've got lots of things to still figure out, not least how do we create a modern design language. We're still using iconography from the 80s and 90s. Um, we could do a lot better than that. Uh, how do we make development easier? Because um, this is something we're doing in Hoodie, which it has been a really interesting experience. I recommend you just take a look at hood.ie and look at the APIs. Um, but it's still complicated, keeping all these various states in your mind and synchronizing. That's just necessarily more difficult than having a single linchpin that everything talks to. Um, so what can we do to make that just really simple? And if you have ideas on any of that or you want feedback on yeah, anything that we've talked about, then go to Offline First. Uh, that's offlinefirst.org. And we list uh, lots of interesting articles. There's a great one there on a list apart by Alex from the Hoodie team. And there's um, a GitHub group uh, which collects all kinds of good examples of design and um, APIs and Offline First development. So that's a good place to go find out some more. Uh, thank you to people who license their works Creative Commons. And that's sort of it, which is a shame. There's so many more things I wanted to talk about. We haven't even touched on service worker, on peer-to-peer -peer communication in the field. There's so many interesting, exciting things we could talk about with offline. If you're about to build an offline app, come find, come find me. Um, I would love to talk to you about it. So thanks. <laughs>